Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our COVID-19 and IBD webinar series. Tonight's topic will be on vaccinations and IBD. Before we begin, if you experience any technical problems during the webinar, try refreshing the page or browser. You can also check the handout provided in this webinar for troubleshooting tips or comment in the question chat box found in the web webinar menu bar. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. A link to the video will be sent to you via email and posted to our website 24 hours after the webinar. French subtitles will be available the, the follow, following week. You can access all our webinar videos here at www.crohnsandcolitis.ca slash COVID-19 webinars. And now I'd like to introduce Mina Mouani, President and CEO of Crohn's and Colitis Canada. Hi everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. As we head into the cooler and shorter days, we've ramped up our online educational resources to ensure you get the support you need in the format that works best for you. Whether that's getting information online, watching an on-demand webinar, or through our digital app. There are many times, however, where you may want to connect with someone going through the same journey as yourself, whether you have IBD or are a caregiver. Our Gutsy Support Program is a virtual support system that connects people affected by Crohn's or colitis. We've expanded Gutsy Support, so along with email, you can now connect by online chat, audio, and or video calls. We also have virtual support groups. Visit our website to find out more on how you can join. There are other times when you just wanna take control of monitoring your own health. My Gut is a free, easy to use app that enables you to track, understand, and manage your journey with Crohn's or colitis. My Gut allows you to keep tabs on how you're feeling and your daily habits to see if there is a correlation to your ongoing wellness. The app also provides you with a personalized dashboard and reports that you can share with your healthcare provider. We continue to invest and enhance this valuable tool. If you haven't already, download the MyGut app. Tonight is our 17th webinar. We remain committed to hosting these webinars as long as you need us to. We'll be holding monthly webinars and we'll increase the frequency if needed. As always, this information and the webinar recordings can be accessed on our website at Crohn'sandcolitis.ca. We hope you could join us again for our next COVID-19 and IBD webinars, which are scheduled for November 5th and December 3rd please mark your calendars. And for our upcoming informative Gutsy Learning Series, the next one is on October 27th on our GEM project. You'll hear about the advancements made in this innovative project that's looking into the causes of Crohn's disease. As you can see, Crohn's and Colitis Canada believes deeply in our mission to cure Crohn's and colitis and to improve the quality of life of children and adults affected by these chronic diseases. We're working hard to support you with information, resources, and through research. As you know, our fundraising has significantly declined because of COVID. Our hope is that we're able to support as many promising research projects as possible. You can help us get there by texting CURE, C-U-R-E, to 20222. A $25 donation will be made towards research. With some of the best and brightest scientists right here in Canada, who knows what discoveries are just around the corner. Now, guess, what, guess what's coming up? November is Crohn's and Colitis Awareness Month. It's a month where we work together to amplify our voices and raise awareness for these chronic diseases. Watch for our emails and be sure to follow at Get Gutsy Canada to find out more about how you can join in. This year has been extremely difficult, but with Thanksgiving upon us, we are reminded about all the things we have to be thankful for. The little things like going outside for a walk, the big things like our family, our friends, our healthcare providers, volunteers, donors, researchers, and passionate supporters. We are so thankful for all the new connections we've made and for all the things we've learned. We're grateful for our IBD family who have come together to help each other through this crisis and the opportunity to help. This Thanksgiving, we send our very best wishes to you and your family for good health and happiness always. With that, we are so grateful to our task force who continues to meet to discuss policies and recommendations necessary for our community. 
Thank you to today's panelists, Dr. Mark Loeb and Dr. Cynthia Sow, in what will be a very interesting discussion on vaccines. And of course, we're so grateful to our moderators who showed their passion and dedication to support our IBD community on an ongoing basis. Dr. Gil Kaplan, who is Professor of Medicine at the University of Calgary. He's an adult gastroenterologist and epidemiologist. He is the chair of our Scientific Medical Advisory Council, as well as the Crohn's and Colitis Canada Board Director. And Dr. Eric Benjamal, who has just made a change and joined us in Toronto as Professor and Pediatric Gastroenterologist at the Hospital for Sick Children and University of Toronto, and Nasbegan Canadian Counselor, as well as Chair-Elect of our Scientific Medical Advisory Council. Thank you to everyone tonight, and we hope you enjoy this webinar. Thanks, Mina. Thanks very much. Uh, unfortunately, we have a little technical difficulty where Dr. Kaplan is not able to connect. He lost his audio, and now he's trying to connect back in. So it might take him a few minutes to, uh, to connect back, but in the meantime, I'll start us off. Uh, I wanted to introduce today's panelists. Uh, first, Dr. Mark Loeb and Dr. Cynthia Xiao, and we'll give a more formal introduction before Dr. Loeb's presentation. Uh, and I wanted to kind of update people on what exactly is happening uh, with the Crohn's and Colitis Canada COVID-19 Task Force. So we met, again, we're meeting about every two weeks at the present time, although that might become more frequent as we move forward because of the second wave, which has hit much of Canada quite hard. Uh, and we've made some updates to the website, made some updates to the recommendations. Generally, nothing too, too major, but I wanted to give you an update as to what you can see on the website. We're hoping we made it more clear and answered some of your questions. You, you did ask us to highlight some of the back to school information, uh, focus not just on students, but on teachers, and make some of the general recommendations a bit more clear. So you can see the Crohn's and Colitis Canada website, Crohn'sandColitis.ca, has gotten a little bit of a refresh. And right on the main page, the two panels, the second two panels are back to school and the uh, recommendations about COVID-19. If you scroll down, you can click on COVID-19 and IBD. And as you can see at the top here, Crohn'sandColitis.ca slash COVID-19, if you want to get directly there. The format is really very similar to what you've seen before. However, there's some new areas on the right-hand side here in terms of back to school. Um, and if I go to the guidance section, and as we had before, are you at risk? That has a new format. So you remember the period that, sorry, the pyramid that we had before is now a bit simplified on the left here. So we heard your recommendations that it was a bit too complicated and we still have the three sections, the low risk or general public health risk, the medium risk, and then the high risk. And then on the left-hand side, you've got who fits into these, these risk categories. For the low risk, it's people under 65 not taking immunosuppression whose IBD is, is in remission and who are not malnourished and have no comorbidities. You've got the recommendations still there. In the medium risk section, you have people who are less than 65 and taking these immunosuppressive medications, and the recommendations are shown here. And in the high risk category, you have people who are 65 years or older uh, or who are under 65 and on oral or intravenous systemic corticosteroids. Uh, who have moderate to severe active inflammation, such as a new diagnosis or a recent flare, and moderate to severe malnutrition, and requirements for parental nutrition or intravenous nutrition are here as well. And so the recommendations are there. You can see they haven't changed all that much. They're pretty well the same as they were before, but a little bit easier to read. If we go back to the back to school section, that's somewhat new here. Uh, I've lost it. Where's the back here? Back to school. Uh, we now have guidance for children and adolescents going back to school. We have considerations for parents of children going back to school. And then we have guidance for teachers and staff. In general, the message is always the same as it is in the, the other uh, categories from the guidance document, that essentially it's really age-based recommendation where children are generally quite safe going back to school, even if they're on immunosuppressive therapies, with the exception of high-dose steroids or children who have severe active inflammation, or children who have malnourished. And that's really that the physician uh, has told your family that your child has moderate to severe active inflammation, uh, or that your child is malnourished as a result of active inflammation that is not yet under control. The data that's coming out from the secure IBD registry, which is people with IBD who get COVID-19, really reinforce that the other medications are safe, and that it really is steroids, age, and probably having severe inflammation 
that put you at risk for having uh, complications from COVID-19. Uh, same with the parent parental considerations. Some things that we talked about that, that parents are raising with us, the pediatric gastroenterologists, are that you have to consider not just whether your child has inflammation and whether they're on steroids, but if they need frequent washroom mask access, you should make sure that they have uh, free washroom access because at the moment, a lot of schools are restricting washroom access to only a couple of people. And that could be a problem if your child has urgency, for example, if they have active colitis, even mild active colitis, or if they have IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, on top of their IBD. The other same thing with school buses, right? So if uh, because of shortages of bus drivers, if they're getting sick and being isolated, or because they're not able to drive because of their age or other factors, some school bus routes have become much longer. So consider whether those long routes are possible for your child with IBD uh, needing washroom access. And then we really want to advocate, and Crohn's and Colitis Canada is doing an excellent job trying to advocate to schools and school boards to try to be flexible with moving in and out of e-learning. Uh, and so children who are kind of in and out of getting sick may need more flexibility than the typical child of going to e-learning uh, rather than staying in person for a full three months or whatever that their uh, recommendation. Similarly, for guidance for teachers and staff at schools, the bottom line is generally, if you're in remission and otherwise healthy, you can follow your local public health guidelines in terms of returning to work and returning to school. Uh, even people who are on immunosuppressive medications or biologics. The exception to that, again, is steroids, high dose steroids, 20 milligrams or more, having severe active inflammation and being malnourished. In those cases, you're at risk for severe complications to COVID-19. And we would recommend thinking about whether or not you can modify your job duties in order to work from home or stay physically distanced from other people. So all of these recommendations are here. You can see updated last week or updated a few days ago, yesterday actually, sorry about that. And um, please read them over if you have any questions, please feed them back to the Crohn's and Colitis staff. We're always looking for your feedback and for your uh, suggestions. And if you have any questions that we haven't addressed in the guidance document, please feel free to let us know and we'll try to meet as a task force and try to address them and provide you with some information. So with that, uh, I will pass it on, I hope, to Dr. Kaplan. Is Dr. Kaplan on? Uh, he thinks his internet is down in his office. Okay, so we'll hold off on Dr. Kaplan for now. Uh, why don't we jump to the first poll question? So Nico or Sarah, are you? Yeah, there we go. So we're hoping to poll the audience a couple of times and see what your feelings are. Okay, so the first poll question is, if Health Canada and the FDA approve a COVID-19 vaccine, what is the likelihood that you will take the COVID-19 vaccine? We're not gonna get into politics today, just if it's approved by Health Canada and the FDA and all the regulatory authorities, what is the likelihood that you would take? We need Jeopardy music for this, I think. All right, so should we show the answer? So 72% say yes. Excellent, that's uh, quite good especially considering the public poll questions that we've heard from the United States and Canada, uh, you're, you're more likely to take the vaccine than the typical Canadian, which I think it was around 50% last time I heard in terms of uh, poll numbers. But let's see if we can hear uh, from Dr. Loeb, Dr. Mark Loeb, and uh, we'll see what you feel afterwards. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Loeb, uh, and we'll put up the introduction slide. We can get the next slide, Nico. So I think we've mixed up the slides. Um, so let me pull up Dr. Loeb's introductory uh, information. Dr. Loeb is an infectious disease expert at McMaster University and an expert really in vaccinology and vaccines. He does a lot of uh, research in the development of vaccines and also the clinical care of patients asking about vaccines. Uh, and he's here to speak to us about, uh, you know, the vaccine landscape and what the likelihood of a COVID-19 vaccine will be 
and what that will look like as we move forward. So I'll let Dr. Loeb provide a little bit more of an introduction for himself, but uh, Dr. Loeb, take it away. Thank you very much. Dr. Loeb, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear you, absolutely. Great, thank you so much. Well, I'd like to begin by just thanking uh, the organizers. Thank you for the uh, the kind invitation to uh, to present tonight. Um, not sure who's controlling the slides, but maybe if I can have the next slide, unless I have control of it. Okay, so, um, you know, there's a huge burden, as you all know, of uh, COVID-19. Um, I just looked on the WHO, dashboard in terms of the, the most recent figures, 36 million cases uh, worldwide with a little over a million deaths. So it's just really a, an enormous burden uh, of illness. And what I thought I, I'd start off with is just showing you the uh, a photo or a diagram of the SARS coronavirus 2, so the agent that causes uh, COVID-19. So as you can see, it's a, this is a figure of a virus and this is a an RNA virus, and what's really important is the the spike glycoprotein. So that's that's essentially the part of the virus that attaches to the re receptor cell, and that begins the whole infection. So very early on, uh, a virus, someone will cough in your face, or you know you'll be in close contact. The virus will hit one of your cells through the spike glycoprotein. And it's really important because this is the antigen that that uh, that all of the vaccines are directed to. So they're either directed to the full length spike glycoprotein or this little blue part, which is the receptor binding uh, domain. Next slide, please. Okay. So I, I put in this uh, this slide just to show you how uh, viruses infect cells. So this is an example of COVID-19. So what happens, as I was saying, is that the the virus will interact with the receptor and it'll get into the the cell. And essentially, it's a lot of complicated things going on. But but essentially, the the virus hijacks the protein making machinery of the cell and then re to replicate itself. And then mature virions, uh, viruses, are, are just leave the cell and then go on to infect other cells. So this is a, a, an early part of the infection, and this is where antivirals would act. They could interact anywhere, you know, depending on the agent, uh, along anywhere in this pathway to stop the infection from getting worse. Uh, next slide, please. So if the if the let's say you don't have any treatment and you just continue and the the infection goes on, ultimately what happens or what could happen is you end up with a severe infection in the lungs. And this is exactly what this slide is showing. It's showing a, a, basically a lot of inflammatory cells uh, in the alveoli, which is really the the tips of the of the lungs. And this is where uh, or the 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 most distal part of the lungs. So this is where drugs like steroids will have an anti-inflammatory effect. So like dexamethasone, and that's about so far the, the really the only therapeutic that's been shown to reduce mortality. So it's really our best agent right now uh, for treating COVID-19. So it's important to, about the timing because you don't want people to be treated with steroids early on because early on that might interfere with the host's ability to um, to basically stop the the virus through its own immune system. So so essentially, steroids are used when there's a lot of inflammation, and that's later on in the infection. Next slide, please. So I showed this slide because it's uh, it it really summarizes uh, what we know. There are different groups that have looked at this, but this is one of the better studies. Uh, where they measured the immune response to actual COVID-19 infection. So these weren't, they weren't patients that were very severely ill, they were moderately ill. Uh, but so what, what's really uh, important to know is that there was a robust immune response. In other words, 100% uh, of the people who got infected with COVID-19 um, mounted a CD4, which is like a T helper cell response, 
and the level of that response correlated to the antibody production. You see this uh, IgG and IgA. About 70% of people had a, uh, a, a CD8 cell response. So that really says that, you know, when under natural infection, there is a, a rigorous immune response, at least to, to healthy people. And what's, what's also very interesting is they didn't only look at people who got infected with COVID-19, but they looked at the response in people who never got infected, and they found there was some cross-reactivity. In other words, people who likely would have been infected you know, many years earlier through uh, exposure to the seasonal coronavirus, those four strains, uh, about 50% of them had a, a CD4 response and 20% of them had a CD8 response. So that might mean that just being exposed to seasonal uh, coronavirus might protect you to at least some degree. Next slide, please. So this slide is, is sort of complicated, but this is what this is, uh, you know, when we're talking about vaccines for, for COVID-19, safety is paramount, of course. So it's safety and efficacy. That's the whole story about vaccines. And one concern has been the possibility for what's called a TH2 response. So what happens there, without going into all of the details, what, ha what happens is that there's a sort of an inflammation that occurs that's due to the vaccine that causes, uh, it's almost like an allergic type of reaction of eosinophils, and that's been seen in um, animal models, mainly in, in SARS-1. Uh, fortunately, the candidate vaccines that are being tested now have a Th1 response, so that's actually good news because that would suggest that it might be more less likely that we'll see this Th2 response, so we don't want to be seeing that. Next slide, please. So the other thing is this term called correlates of protection. So I, so, I showed you that slide of, of uh, what happens when people get naturally infected. So there's antibodies, there's neutralizing antibodies, and then there's these T cell and uh, B cell sort of uh, reactions. And no one knows right now whether it's a really a, a T cell response that will be protective against COVID-19 or will it be neutralizing antibodies or maybe both of those? So that's important to know because when we know that, you could measure that and have an idea of what's actually protecting people. Um, but you know, I, I just show this because this is a correlate of protection for influenza. We've been studying influenza uh, for many years and even now we don't really have a, a really good correlate of protection for that virus. We have things called HAI titers, and an HAI titer of 140 just gives us about a 50% likelihood of protection. So that's almost like flipping the coin. It's not very, you know, it's not very good. It's a little bit better in children. We know that a titer of one in 360 is protective, uh, but we still debate about the role of T cells in protection for, for influenza. So there is a body of literature that suggests that T cells might be important in older adults, but it's, it's not a slam dunk. So it's still controversial. So I'm just saying that because it might be a while be before we really understand um, what's really the correlate of protection for COVID-19. Next slide, please. So I want to get into now how vaccines work before going into the, the COVID-19 vaccine. So if you look at the first figure, figure one, uh, basically what vaccines do, they introduce either a whole virus uh, that's been inactivated or sometimes a live uh, virus that's been attenuated or bits and pieces of the virus. Okay, so those are introduced into the body. And then your immune system has these dendritic cell, cells that are called, that are antigen presenting cells, they take those components that have been injected into them and they will show them, they'll present them to T cells and they'll stimulate this sort of, this number of T cells and B cells that will recognize the virus, which is like the vaccine, and they'll rapidly expand in number, they'll increase. Some of the T cells, like in figure four, will uh, directly kill cells that are infected. Those are CD8 T cells. Others like the T helper cells, CD4 cells, will secrete signals to uh, create a bigger uh, immune reaction. And, and they'll basically get the B cells to produce these antibodies. So you can see the antibodies are these little Y-shaped molecules that just really block the virus from attaching to the receptor uh, uh, on the cell that they usually infect. 
And uh, not only that, a small proportion of both the T cells and the B cells become, become long-lived memory cells so that the next time you see, well, the next time when you see the real virus happening, uh, you know, all these, all this sort of reaction will occur, but it'll occur faster and it will protect you. And essentially, you know, that's how vaccines work. Next slide, please. So in terms of the types of vaccines, again, just generally and for COVID-19, there are inactivated vaccine, and those are generally chemically treated uh, vaccines, so they're not live. <clears throat> the live vaccines, uh, often they're attenuated vaccines, so they're live, they create a, a really rigorous immune response, so sometimes you only need one dose there. Uh, there are subunit vaccines, so that's bits and pieces of the, the virus, sometimes it's just a, a protein. Then there are recombinant vectors, and a number of the COVID-19 vaccines are these recombinant vectors. Basically, what you take is a as a, a an adenovirus or something like that as a vehicle, and you put a piece of nucleic acid uh, from, for example, spike into it, and then that infects somebody, and that's the vaccine that creates the immune response. Uh, there are also nu nucleic acid vaccines, RNA and DNA. Those often, you know, they can create an immune response. Often, you'll need you know, more than one dose for those. And then there are virus-like particles that, that simulate uh, a, a virus, but, it, but it's particles put together and they simulate your immune system to protect you as well. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, COVID-19 vaccines, they're using platforms that are pathogen agnostic. And that means that there are platforms where, you know, you can insert a piece of the spike uh, you know, the, the spike antigen to protect you against COVID-19, but it could be other viruses as well. So they don't really, the platforms work for, you know, different, different viruses. So it's good in terms of that, because if it's successful, it could be used for other viruses. So these platforms express uh, an antigen and make a vaccine to multiple pathogens on the same platform. And again, it could be the ones we were talking about, nucleic acid vaccines, protein subunits, non-replicating vector vaccines. So it's very exciting. Uh, however, uh, you know, they don't have that track record in, 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 in the sense that they've never been scaled up before. So this is, this is a, a sort of a test in a way. Next slide, please. So this is uh, just a diagram showing the, these pathogen agnostic platforms. So, you know, I mentioned, I showed you the, the spike protein before. So essentially, if you, you take a, uh, a uh, COVID-19 uh, or the SARS coronavirus uh, two, you take the uh, the gene that codes for the spike protein and you put it, let's say, in an adenovirus, and that infects somebody. Usually, those are injection types of vaccines, and that'll create that antibody response that that we just went over a few minutes ago. Uh, another way to do this is to create a subunit vaccine, so the spike will just code for a protein, and you'll get a lot of these free-floating spike proteins causing immune response. And for the nu nucleic acid vaccines, it's just those bits of RNA or DNA, DNA that are just taken up into the cell and create a, an immune response. Next slide, please. So in terms of clinical trials, it's important to understand that there's a sequence. So when you look at COVID-19, there's preclinical data. So there has to be data that, that suggests that there's a promise to the, to the, to the antigens. Uh, and then once the preclinical data that might or might not include animal models, uh, once it's felt that there's enough data for this to work in people, then there'll be a phase one study. So usually that's a pretty small trial involving 50 or 60 people. They're called first in human studies. And it's really all about safety, just to make sure that you don't, you know, you don't try the vaccine in 10 people, you try it one or two people, you watch really carefully, and then you just continue to expand to make sure it's safe. And you also measure the immune response. So there's sort of stop and go uh, uh, stop and go rules, and if everything looks good, then you go to phase two. So phase two is usually there are trials that involve 500 or 600 people, and those are randomized controlled trials. So vaccine versus placebo, and you're looking at uh, at uh, immune response. So you're looking at what we were talking about before, the T cell response, neutralizing antibodies, and it's then it's the same sort of thing. If that looks good, then you go to the definitive trial, which is the phase three study. 
Here you're taking 10,000 to 40,000 people and you're randomizing them either to the vaccine or to the placebo, but it's a, you know, it's sort of a, in real life because you're, they're getting exposed to COVID vaccine. And the hypothesis, of course, is that those people who are exposed to the vaccine will be less likely to develop COVID-19 versus those that got the placebo. Uh, by and large, the trials, the primary outcome of the trial is COVID-19 tested by PCR. And most of the uh, regulatory bodies want an efficacy of 50% risk reduction. So they want that vaccine to be at least 50% reduction with a 30% at the lower uh, efficacy at the lower confidence interval. Next slide, please. So the traditional approach to vaccine development uh, is very long and expensive. You know, you select a target, you do animal studies, you do a phase one study, and if it's safe, then you progress. But it's, you know, it's not overlapped. It's very sequential. There are multiple stops along the way. Uh, once the vaccine has been shown to be effective, then it moves to manufacture and scale. So it's over. Generally, you know, it takes a 10 year period of time to do this. Next slide, please. The pandemic approach is, is very different because, you know, there'll be animal studies and first in human studies sometimes done in parallel. The safety and the dose selection are done at the same time. Manufacturing has to occur before you even have any idea whether the vaccine is going to work. So, you know, if you're a vaccine company, you're, you're, you know, you're going uh, out on a limb. Uh, and so the companies are taking a, a large amount of risk, making millions of dose with, doses with the hope that the vaccine will work. Next slide, please. So in this slide just summarizes what I've been saying. There's accelerated timelines. So basically, you know, it's not 10 years of academic research. Skip that, go into preclinical, phase one, phase two, phase three trials. It's all sort of overlapped. And, and as, as the phase three are going on, the doses, the manufacturing process is going on. Then, you know, if everything is, go, is good, the vaccine is approved, and then you get into a distribution mode. Next slide, please. So this is a landscape of COVID-19 candidates in phase three trials. So if you look at the overall, you could go to a WHO website and they keep it relatively up to date. There are over 200 candidates, but there's, there's only a select few that I'm showing you here that are, oh, go back, back up one side, please. We, yeah, so there's only a few select that are in phase three. So this is the 10,000 to 40,000 uh, range. So you could see here that, that a lot of them are, you know, those new platforms I was mentioning, the non-replicating vir viral vector, you know, basically these genetically engineered viruses. Uh, that's that's the, uh, here's the, the Oxford AstraZeneca one, for example. Uh, there's one from uh, CanSino Biologics. There's an RNA vaccine from uh, from Moderna, non-replicating from Janssen protein subunit and uh, RNA. So you get a whole bunch of types. I've highlighted the ones that the Canadian government has made uh, procurement arrangements with. So these are, of course, uh, companies that are not based in Canada, but but uh, as you might have heard of in the news, the Canadian government has said, well, you know, we're going to procure these uh, these vaccines. So one of the major limitations we have in Canada is that we do not have biomanufacturing capability for vaccines. So we have scientists who can develop vaccines, but to actually, you know, dose, make millions of doses, uh, you know, package them, do, do all that sort of stuff, that has to be done right now, uh, unfortunately, outside of the country. Next slide, please. Uh, oh, yes, and this is just uh, to show you, these are just er very early stage candidate vaccines that are being done, uh, being uh, looked at in Canada. So, uh, so virus like particles, DNA, protein subunit, replicating vectors, uh, DNA. So all of the types of uh, vaccines I was talking uh, about. And that was my, nas my last slide, thank you. Thank you, Mark, it's, uh, it's Gil Kaplan. Um, and I, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, Mark, actually, if you could nod, if you could hear me as well, just so I know. Thank you. Yeah, um, no, I, I can hear you well, Gil. Okay, perfect. I just want to apologize to you and to the audience for uh, disappearing. Um, I'm in my, my office and my internet completely just crashed on me just a moment before the um, webinar started. Um, and, that, and that's why you and all the other panelists lost me just as you, as you were going live. 
Um, but I'm, I'm now actually on my phone, which is the first time in the 17 webinars that we've done that I've done it off my iPhone. So I, I hope that this um, projects okay. Um, and I just wanted to, to start by just thanking you for, for your presentation uh, and, and for the work that you've done um, shepherding um, vaccine research um, over the past several decades, including the battle that you're taking amongst a number of scientists around the world uh, in, in leading um, research for a vaccine for COVID. And, and I guess one of my first kind of follow-up questions to your, your presentation is, you know, we see so many different countries working on vaccine trials um, and there are different stages. And for example, um, the Russian government just recently approved um, uh, regulatory approval of their vaccine after just less than two months of limited human testing. And admittedly, Health Canada and the FDA were, were taking a much more guarded approach. And it just, you know, and that's leading to a little bit of concern and angst amongst many people of the safety of a vaccine for COVID. And I just wanted to get your perspective on, you know, what is the approach that Health Canada is going to take to approve a vaccine? Um, what, what does it have to prove in terms of being effective and safe so that people can feel confident in the vaccine that, that we'll ultimately get? Yeah. So, Gil, I mean, that's a really, really important question. I think, I think uh, people have to know that Health Canada both in terms of their ability, you know, in terms of the, their approvals for vaccines and also biomanufacturing, they are just top notch, right? So, you know, like they would never approve a vaccine that hasn't gone through all the stages and particularly they would never approve a vaccine that hasn't gone through a phase three randomized controlled trial. So they are they are being obviously very, very careful, but it's great because at the same same time, they're putting huge resources into uh, quick turnaround. So if you have a candidate vaccine and you want to bring it to Health Canada for approval for testing, you know, they're they're basically saying that they're gonna turn it around in about two weeks, which is, you know, which is amazing. So they're, they're, they really do a, a, an awesome job in terms of, of, of regulating both the approval of vaccines and also the biomanufacturing process. That's excellent. And then just giving us a little bit more information around um, what in these clinical trials, how, how are patients being studied and, and participants being studied for the safety of the vaccine? Um, and because, and, and are they looking at different populations um, beyond just, you know, not, not initially healthy volunteers are looked at initially, and as you go through the phase, there's more people. Um, if you could talk a little bit about the, about the safety. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so basically, you know, the bottom line with, with any vaccine, but particularly, particularly with COVID-19 vaccine, is that pharmacovigilance, you know, like a, a fancy word for safety, has to, has to go throughout. So it has to start at phase one, phase two, phase two, and phase three. So, and so, um, you know, there's, there has to be a very, very, um, you know, careful assessment of, of safety throughout. Now, it's also important to know that, you know, that even though you have a 10, 10 you know, 10,000, 20,000, or even a 30,000 uh, person trial, and there's no safety signal, that's really good. But sometimes you need, you, you know, you need much higher numbers to detect a safety signal. So just because a trial, a phase three trial has proved successful and is safe, that's good. And it's, it's good to be, you know, it's, it's, you know, if all of those boxes are checked, it's, you know, shown efficacy and safety, it could go on to, you know, to, to having people vaccinated, but you never want to stop uh, the pharmacovigilance. You want to continue because you want to make sure that if there's a very rare safety signal, it you know it could get you know 30,000 won't be enough. You might need three million doses to see it. So you really have to always uh, be very very careful. Um, now, in terms of your other question, in terms of participants who are getting the vaccine, that's you know that depends on the trial. So there are some studies that are using. Uh, participants who are like healthy between the ages of 18 and 65. Some are going beyond 65. Some are some are enrolling people who have medical conditions that are stable. So it really depends on the um, on the study. Gil. Thank you. And then once a vaccine is approved, like how long do vaccines last for? 
Um, is this something like we see some like the influenza vaccine, we get the shot every year, other vaccines, you just need it once. Do you have a sense of how long it's going to take, um, how long the, the vaccine will last? And, and what do you think that will be for, for a COVID vaccine? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Yeah, and it's hard to say because it, it really, because first of all, our, you know, our knowledge right now of the natural infection of COVID-19 is, is relatively poor, right? We don't know if someone, and there's been, you know, as I showed uh, before, there've been millions and millions of people who've been infected with COVID-19. And so, so we don't really know, well, how long are those people protected? There aren't any good studies, right? So, so it's really difficult to say how long someone will be protected for with a particular vaccine uh, because you know that has to be tested you know that's that's point number one point number two is it'll depend uh, to a certain extent on the type of vaccine so if you have a live attenuated vaccine uh, based on previous experience it's fair to say that there might be more of a prolonged uh, period of protection if you have a DNA or a RNA vaccine it's likely that you'll need you know, multiple doses uh, just to prolong the, the level of protection. Uh, and even if you look at those vector vaccines that are using adenoviruses, they're not all the same. Some might lead to, to longer protection than others. So you know, the bottom line is you know, we have to continue to study that. We have to continue to do randomized controlled trials. And even once they're done, we need to do long-term studies in those people who've been vaccinated to answer those really important questions that you're asking. And you know, the, the one uh, comment you made about the fact that Canada doesn't have a biological manufacturing facility to produce vaccines. So I'm just curious, when a vaccine is approved, what happens next? How do you go from approval of a vaccine to vaccinating 37 million Canadians? Okay, so I mean, there are approvals, you know, there, there, there has to be when a vaccine is approved, you know, for Canada, there's, there's also biomanufacturing approval. So it's all, it's really, really carefully regulated. Okay, so let's say uh, Canada, you know, let's say there's a, there's a successful vaccine, let's say Canadian, you know, uh, developed vaccine, and let's say it's being manufactured outside of the country, and then it's sent back. Uh, what about distribution? Um, that's one thing, you know, I do think that, you know, for us, biomanufacturing is a weakness. Distribution is a strength, though. Um, you know, if you look at during H1N1, uh, Canada did a really good job distributing the, the vaccine to high-risk groups. So I don't think we're going to fall there, to be honest. I, I, think, I think we'll do a good job once we have a secure vaccine. That's excellent. And, you know, there are a lot of people who are hesitant about, about vaccines in, in general. And I just wanted to, you to give us some comments about what happens if we people refuse to get vaccinated. If we don't get kind of a, a large turnout of people taking a COVID vaccine, what is the impact going to be to protecting people like, like patients with inflammatory bowel disease who are, are a bit more vulnerable to, to this disease? Yeah, so that, that question is this whole you know issue of herd effect or sometimes called herd immunity. And the, the concept there is that, you know, the more people that get vaccinated, the less likely that the COVID-19 will circulate. So that's been the, the focus of my research for the, next, the last 15 years or so has been vaccinating children to, to stop the spread in entire communities and to see that, that indirect protection. So the idea basically is if you vaccinate healthy people, they develop a very rigorous immune response and so, and if there's enough people, the, the thresholds might vary depending on the, you know, on the vaccine and the pathogen that you're talking about. But if there are high enough levels, um, because everybody is immune, the, the virus just won't circulate. So the, the answer then is that if there's low levels of uptake, that, that is a risk for other people, uh, particularly for those who might not be able to mount a, a, a rigorous a robust immune response to vaccine themselves. And so just my, my last question is just kind of a, a final reflection on, on things. Do you, do you think a, a vaccine can get us back to normal? Well, that's a hard <laughs> question, you know, because I, I, I do think it'll go a long way. And, and I think it's, it'll probably be more complicated, right? Because it'll probably not be um, one vaccine. It might be different vaccines. Um, but I think, you know, we will be in the physical distancing and, and mask 
scenario for quite a while, but I think the vaccines will help enormously. And I think it's it's a really important, it'll be a really important step uh, forward, but we have to do it as we've been very carefully, uh, making sure that the vaccine is effective, is safe, and is also effective in the populations that need it the most. Thank you. And, and Mark, we're going to have you come back a, a little bit later on um, when we talk about some of the vaccine guidelines for inflammatory bowel disease patients. But really, we appreciate for your presentation, your time to be able to answer these complicated questions about COVID vaccines. Okay, thanks, Gil. Um, and so, um, so I think if um, this is going to be a little bit different for me because I, I usually uh, control the screen and uh, I'm not on my iPhone, but I just wanted to still give everyone kind of an update. So if we go to the, the next slide. Um, thank you. So again, as uh, for people who've watched these webinars before, um, this is a very familiar slide that shows us that there's been over 36 million people who have tested um, positive for COVID throughout the world in over 188 countries throughout the world that are battling with COVID right now with over a million people who have unfortunately succumbed to, to the disease. And, um, and if we can go to the, the next slide, it will show us um, what's happening uh, in Canada. Uh, and we see that there are over 170,000 um, cases of COVID across Canada. And one of the interesting slides, if, if you look at the bottom left hand corner, you, you'll see this orange graph where, where it actually goes from April, July to October. And you can see in Canada that we had a spike of cases um, in April and in May. And you can actually see that there has been a lull across July. And it looks like we're now entering that second wave of COVID-19 um, that we've all been kind of predicting and we're seeing on the news. And if we go to the next slide, um, um, what, we, what we can see here is how those 173,000 cases are distributed um, across the, the country. Um, with the provinces with the highest populations having the most cases. But if you go to the next slide, you'll see the cases standardized to the population. So the number of people who have um, uh, COVID relative to the number of people um, um, living in the province. So if you, just go, if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see you'll see these are the, the incidence rates, the rates of cases per 100,000 people. And we continue to see that Quebec um, has the highest um, burden of COVID in the country. Um, but unfortunately, if you look here at Alberta, uh, it now is the second highest um, provi uh, province in the country, surpassing Ontario in terms of cases per population. And part of that reason is, has been um, um, outbreaks that we've seen throughout the province, including in hospitals. And, and in particular, I work at, at the Foothills Hospital, um, where we've been dealing um, you know, firsthand with a really bad outbreak um, that's affected a number of the, of the, the wards, um, the patients in the hospital and, and the healthcare providers and uh, reminding us, you, you know, of the importance uh, of this disease and how we're going into the second wave um, over, the, over the fall. And if you go to the, the next slide, uh, and, and actually, uh, Nico, if you can just advance um, ac across, this is an animated slide, it shows the outcomes um, in BC and then the next slide, will the next click will show us in the prairies and then next in um, Ontario, Quebec, and then followed by the Maritimes. And you can just see across um, where these look very similar to, to the data that we reported um, in the past, where we're seeing the highest burden of disease in terms of case fatality rates still in um, Quebec and Ontario, where the, the western part of Canada's Maritimes um, tend to still have had pretty good outcomes in terms of the people who have, uh, have contracted the, the disease. Um, and so if we go to the, to the next slide, um, this is the Secure IBD database. It's a database I've been showing with, with every webinar, and it reflects the number of cases of individuals with inflammatory bowel disease who have contracted COVID. And you can see that there are now over 2,500 cases um, in countries all throughout the world that have reported the cases. There's actually been two publications that have come out of the database, one published in gastroenterology and one recently in gut. Again, highlighting the most important risk factor really is, is age um, as being a, a risk factor for the most severe complications of COVID. And so if we go to the, the next slide, I, I just want to uh, spend a moment just to answer this really important question and kind of a lead up to um, uh, Eric's uh, and Cynthia com coming on board to talk about, about vaccines and IBD. And really the question is, 
why should everyone get a flu shot during the COVID-19 pandemic? And, and the, the short answer to this question is yes, everyone should. And I'm gonna um, show you some reasons why that's the case as we go to the next slide. And actually in the very first um, webinar, I actually showed this slide, this was back on March 19th, um, and it shows um, why, uh, how, how COVID is different from influenza, the flu. And this first um, um, uh, point is the R naught, which is how infected is the flu versus COVID-19. And we can see the flu infects about, for every one person gets infected, that person tends to infect one and a third people, which is double the rate in COVID-19. Now, this is based on the properties of the virus. If you do things like physical distancing, mask wearing, you can actually bring down the infectious of, of the virus. Um, and then if you go to the, to the, the next um, point, um, we can see the case fatality rate. So what is the proportion of people who die who get um, infected? And, and the flu is actually low, less than 0.1% of the uh, population with the flu, um, where in Canada, the case fatality rate for COVID-19 is 1.6%. And this was based on, on a study that came out of the Canadian Medical Association Journal a few months ago that standardized the, the death rate against not only reported cases, but also adjust, adjusted for unrecorded cases of, of COVID-19 that tend to be more mild. So if we go to the next slide, um, we can see some really interesting data from the United Kingdom that's just been re recently published. Looking in this, um, this blue slide is the number of people who have died in the UK from January to the end of August from COVID, approximating nearly 50,000 people, which is considerably higher than people dying from influenza and even pneumonia. And in fact, if you go to the next slide, which is a little bit of a complicated graph, but what it shows you um, is the number of people who have died from influenza and pneumonia together in these um, yellow bars, dating back from 2000 all the way to 2020. And in the background is the number of people who have died from COVID in the first nine to 10 months of the pandemic. And you can see here, year after year after year, COVID has been much more um, um, virulent, much more deadly than influenza and pneumonia combined. So if we go to the, the next slide, and, and this is just information looking at what's happened to the flu season in the Southern Hemisphere. So everyone has to remember in the Southern Hemisphere, um, winter um, happens in summer, in, in our summer, and that's when they get their flu outbreak. And what you can see here in the, in the bottom of, of this graph is the number of weeks into 2019 with this week 52 being the end of 2019 and week one, being um, the first week of 2020. And then if you click on the, on the next point, you can see that um, this week 11 of 2020 is when WHO declares a lockdown. And the things that happen in the lockdown in terms of you know, us being at home and then subsequently the hygiene, the physical distancing, and later on the masks, what you can see here is that the number of reported influenza cases dropped dramatically um, through the course of the rest of 2020. And if you go to the next slide, it, it's actually even more graphic because um, what this will show you, and, and uh, Nico, if you could just hit the next uh, slide, this is the, um, it, the number of, of, or proportion of people who um, tested positive for influenza in Australia in 2019. And then if you click on the next one, you can see in that same period between April and August is significantly less number of people um, tested positive for influenza during that same time period. And that's it in Australia. And if you click on the next two, you'll see data from South Africa. And, and, and also the next point would be um, in 2019. And also in 2020, we see a lot less cases of influenza um, in the Southern hemisphere. And so this, if we go to the next slide, um, this brings us to this notion that the things that we're doing today, these past few months to protect us from COVID, um, in the Southern Hemisphere, it looks like that's actually reduced the amount of flu that's happened. Um, and, and that's really important. Now, of course, we don't know exactly what's gonna happen in, in the Northern Hemisphere, in Canada, for example, because the second wave of flu season is approaching us um, right now. But we do know that if we do things like hygiene, physical distancing, wearing masks, screening for symptoms, testing and contact tracing and subsequent isolation, those are effective in protecting us from from COVID-19, and it also may also reduce the rates of influenza. But for in, and if, if you click the next slide, um, the key thing is, um, uh, if, sorry, if you, Nico, if you click on the next uh, image here, um, what you'll see is just a graphic 
of the Swiss cheese model, which tells us that any one of these events is not sufficient to control the virus. And in fact, if you relied on just one, so for example, just rapid testing, um, um, you could get an outbreak. And we saw this, for example, um, at the White House currently, when they relied on testing and then didn't do the other pieces, the physical distancing, the wearing masks to protect themselves. And now we're dealing with, with a huge outbreak um, in the, the upper echelons of the leadership of the United States. And so if we go to the, the, the next point, the big difference between what we have to treat influenza and what we have for COVID-19 is that we do have a vaccine for influenza. And that's an additional tool in our toolbox to be able to reduce the burden of influenza during the second wave of COVID. And if we go to the, the next slide, yeah, and it's my last slide, and it's just a point that I wanted to make um, that why is it so important to get your flu shot? Well, it comes down to five key points. And the first thing is, um, we were all of us were worried about a twindemic where you'd have a rapid rise in, in second wave in the fall uh, and winter of COVID-19, followed by um, um, cases of, of influenza. Um, and if we get lots of cases, for every case of influenza that ends up in hospital, that's one less bed, that's one less intensive care room, one less physician and nurse to be able to care for somebody with COVID. And so if we have something that is avoidable, that is preventable through a vaccine, we're going to better treat our healthcare system um, if you get a flu shot. Secondly, we know that a lot of the symptoms of flu overlap with that of COVID-19, and that's going to make it really difficult, challenging to make a diagnosis of flu over COVID-19, something that we didn't really have to deal with during the first wave. And so if we can prevent flu, that's going to help us a lot in the second wave. Um, the other thing, and this is a really important point, is because COVID is a brand new disease, we don't know what the impact of getting flu is on COVID-19, or vice versa. If you get COVID-19, what would be the impact if you then something about flu? And the best way to protect yourself from this unknown is to vaccinate and prevent the, the disease. Um, and then the fourth point is that even though I've, you know, the death rate of, of influenza is 0.1%, it's still not zero. Um, and people can be hospitalized and they can die. And we know that, that if you have a flu vaccine, it is not 100% perfect. There are some people who will still get flu, but there's a lot of data to show that that risk of severity of illness is reduced if you, if you get your flu shot. And so my very last point is that the one thing we can do is if everyone gets their flu shot, um, um, if we know that if less people get the flu, we can now focus on, on COVID-19. So I'll stop there and I'll bring um, Eric um, back to the fold here and see if we can um, learn about some of the important vaccines that we have for, for the IVD population. And Eric, thank you so much for managing during my chaotic loss. So the first time in 17 episodes where one of the two of us just disappeared during um, during the webinar. Yeah, no, it is the first time, which is pretty good considering all the technical difficulties people have learned to live with over the past six months. But uh, no, thanks, Gail. I mean, I think it worked well to have you present and, and thank you to the to Nico and Sarah for advancing the slides for him. Um, okay, so can we put up the next poll question before I start speaking? So the poll question will be directly related to what Gil was speaking about just now. If we can get it up, the poll question really is, uh, are you planning on getting the flu vaccine this year? So if you can fill that poll question, give it about 10 seconds. All right, so can we see the results? Oh, 93% say yes. That is impressive. I probably should have asked that poll question before Gil spoke instead of after. I'm sure Gil was persuasive to get it, but hopefully I'll be even more persuasive to that 6% who's not sure. Um, all right, so I'm going to share my slides now. Can somebody give me a slide sharing permission? Oh, wait, I've got it now. There we go. Good. So everybody should be able to see my slides, although I don't think it's, uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, perfect. 
So I'm, I'm going to present a little bit about the uh, new clinical practice guidelines that are coming, not yet published by the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology, uh, sort of from the context of what it means for you as patients. Um, Canadian Association of Gastroenterology is the national group of gastroenterologists, the professional society of gastroenterologists and pediatric gastroenterologists in the country. And they produce regular clinical practice guidelines, very uh, rigorously developed clinical practice guidelines for doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners to help guide them on how to, um, uh, how to treat patients with IBD and other conditions. And of course, the light in my office just went off just as I started speaking. So hopefully you can't see me. Uh, I'll turn on the light after I'm done. So these clinical practice guidelines uh, were co-chaired by myself and Dr. Jennifer Jones from Dalhousie University, who unfortunately was not able to join us tonight. And can somebody tell me, do they see me on the webcam or? Yeah, I guess other people can see that my light was out. Okay, give me a second and I'm gonna turn on the light. But I just wanted to introduce who the co-authors of the guidelines were. The co-authors are listed here. It really is a national group of co-authors, uh, gastroenterologists and infectious disease specialists from across the country, adult and pediatric providers who, uh, who really uh, aided in creating these guidelines. And we have Dr. Cynthia Xiao here from the University of Calgary, who is going to be uh, one of the co-presenters and panelists to explain the guidelines as they go. As well, we had patient representatives, and this was actually the first time I believe that patient representatives took such a, an active role in creation of a clinical practice guideline for CAG. Uh, so we really appreciate the, the IBD patient and family members who uh, participated in giving feedback on these guidelines. And I should say that there, uh, sort of a disclaimer here is that uh, these are really, this is a trailer, okay? It's an appetizer, like a movie trailer. They have not yet been peer reviewed or published and they're under peer review at a scientific journal now. And so they may change slightly from the final version. It's also important to note that I can't present them in full because they haven't been peer reviewed and published. So it's really just to give you an idea of what we will be talking about. And I can't present it publicly for two reasons. Number one is that there's confidentiality agreements with the journal. So at the time the, the, the publication happens, they ask before that, that we don't, we don't, talk about the publication. And some of these aspects of the, the clinical practice guideline may change as a result of the peer review process, although it's highly unlikely that there's gonna be any major changes. However, given the importance of the Crohn's and Colitis Canada webinar series and speaking to all of you, CAG gave me permission, formally gave me permission to be able to uh, talk to you about these guidelines ahead of time. So you're getting an appetizer right now. Uh, it's also important to note that there are strict conflict of interest policies whenever we talk about vaccine research and vaccine recommendations. There's always a question of what our conflicts of interest are. The two chairs, myself and Dr. Jones, could have no high risk conflicts of interest at all. Uh, so we could not have conflicts of interest related to companies that produce vaccines. More than 50% of the committee had to have no high risk conflicts of interest as well. And members who were in direct conflict of interest, meaning that they had worked with vaccine manufacturing companies, they could participate in the discussion, but they could not vote on the statements. And the guidelines were supported by an unrestricted grant to CAG from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and from Can Immunize. So no vaccine company, no vaccine producer was involved with the creation of these guidelines at all. So let's talk a little bit about the, the process that we take in producing these guidelines. So first, the idea is approved by the CAG Clinical Affairs Committee. We then develop what's called PICO questions. What's the population we want to study? What's the intervention we want to study? What's the comparator and what's the outcome? And these were really related to all vaccines that we wanted to study. So each of these had to be evaluated and outcomes were primarily the effectiveness of the vaccine, so how well it works, specifically in IBD patients. But if, uh, if there wasn't evidence in IBD, IBD patients, it could be in other immunosuppressed patients, for example. It was also safety, so we wanted to make sure that there was safety of the vaccine if we were gonna recommend it. And then there was also cost effectiveness, cost benefit ratio. So we wanted to make sure that it wasn't gonna bankrupt the healthcare system if we recommended this vaccine for use and that it was cost effective. The questions were then reviewed by the patient representatives. There was then a systematic review of the literature. 
We evaluated the literature for the quality, so how well designed the studies were in the literature, and we used something called the grade process. The statements were written. We then had the, the consensus meeting to review each of the statements and recommendation. There was discussion, revision, and then voting. And if we couldn't agree, we may revise again and vote again. And there were some statements that we just could not agree on, and you'll see one a little bit later. The manuscript was then written, reviewed again by the patient representatives, and then reviewed by all of CAG's membership. So all the gastroenterologists in the country and pediatric gastroenterologists in the country reviewed it and provided comments. And then we had to address their comments before we submitted it to the journal for peer review and then eventually uh, official release from CAG. So that's where we are in the process right now. So some recommendations, um, not all of them. Again, some important ones for, I think, particularly COVID-19, the world in COVID-19. So the first general recommendation we made was that gastroenterologists or nurses should do a complete review of the patient's immunization, immunization history at diagnosis with IBD and at regular intervals afterwards by the gastroenterologist. So don't leave it up to the family physician or pediatrician. The gastroenterologist needs to be responsible and review what the immunization history is. Practically, this can be very, very difficult, particularly for adult gastroenterologists. So it's worth mentioning that uh, if the adult gastroenterologist seems rushed and isn't able to have time to ask you these questions, about immunization history, it's worthwhile for you to advocate for yourself and give your immunization history. So go to your gastroenterologist with that card that tells you the immunization history or the app can immunize if you use the app. And that may trigger the doctor to do a full review of your immunity and see what vaccines you might need or what, what other measures you might need. Recommendation two is all appropriate vaccines should be given optimally as soon as possible ideally before, prior, before starting immunosuppressive therapy, because we know that immunosuppressive therapy may reduce uh, your response to the vaccine, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but also you won't be able to get live vaccines if you're on immunosuppressive therapy. Again, we'll mention that in a second. But if you require urgent therapy, you should not delay the urgent therapy for your IBD in order to get a vaccine. It's more important that you get the treatment for IBD rather than the vaccine at the moment. And we can deal with the vaccine issue later. So we split the recommendations into two groups, live vaccines and what we call inactive or not live vaccines, as Mark mentioned earlier. Examples of live vaccines are the MMR vaccine, which really is only given in toddlers, or so one-year-old, 18 months old, and sometimes four to six-year-olds. Chickenpox vaccine, varicella, the rotavirus vaccine, which is really only given in infancy, so below the age of one, and then the nasal spray influenza vaccine, not the injection influenza vaccine. The nasal spray or flu mist is the brand name, is a live vaccine. It's now very much fallen out of favor. There was a time a few years ago in Quebec that was all you could get, but we now know that the nasal spray flu mist is not as effective as the inactive injectable vaccine. So that's not an issue. There was also a shingles live vaccine. We'll talk about that in a second. That's also no longer recommended. Uh, but in general, live vaccines should be given unless you're on immunosuppressive therapy. So immunosuppressive therapy includes uh, medicines like azathioprine, 6-MP, uh, methotrexate, and also all the biologic med medicines, infliximab, Remicade, Humira, all of those, as well as tofacid and Ibers, Elgans. So don't give live vaccines if you're on those. It is also worth mentioning that there are travel vaccines that are live. None of us are doing a lot of traveling right now, but you shouldn't get a live vaccine if you're on these medicines. We also looked at pregnant women with IBD, knowing that rotavirus is given in the first year of life. And we couldn't make a recommendation for or against giving live vaccines to the children, the infants of women who are on biologics in the first six months of life. And that's a new recommendation. Prior to this, we were saying absolutely don't give, uh, don't give live vaccines like rotavirus in the first six months of life because the baby may still have the biologic on board, the infliximab or Remicade or Humira, uh, it may still have that in their blood system. But there is some evidence, weak evidence, that maybe it's safe to give the live vaccine. In general, we just couldn't come to a conclusion for or against giving the live vaccine. So if you're pregnant and you're on a biologic, speak to your gastroenterologist, speak to your obstetrician, and then speak to the baby's pediatrician before deciding what to do going forward. 
Now, there's a whole list of inactive or non-live vaccines in the guidelines. Uh, some of them are listed here. I'm going to focus on a few of them, shingles, the flu, uh, and some of the other vaccines that are given, particularly in schools, uh, and we'll talk about that in a second. So firstly, uh, yeah, and I, I should say that in general, all of these vaccines are, are recommended for people with IBD, even if they're immunosuppressed, even if they're on biologics. Being on biologics or being immunosuppressed does not seem to increase your chance of having a bad event, a bad reaction to these vaccines. And you cannot get the virus from these vaccines because there's no live virus particles in these vaccines, as opposed to in live vaccines, if you're immunosuppressed, you may theoretically develop the virus from the vaccine itself because your, your immune system can't react against the vaccine. In the case of these vaccines, there's no live virus, so it's safe to give. Now, there is question as to whether they mount a full response, and we'll talk about what that means in a second, but whether you can actually become fully immune when you're on biologics or immunosuppressives and you get these vaccines. So let's talk about shingles. So there were nine cohort studies in the literature, nine studies that show that IBD patients are about 1.2 to 1.8 times increased risk of developing shingles. And probably they're at increased risk even more if they're on biologics. And then we know that one small molecule, Zelljans, definitely increases your risk of developing shingles. And so the recommendation, and the risk increases with age as well. It's important to note that the new shingles vaccine is a recombinant vaccine, it's not a live vaccine, and it's in fact one of those rare cases where it's more effective than the live vaccine was the first version that we had. So as a result of this new vaccine becoming available and knowing that a lot of patients are on biologics, we are recommending that shingles be given to all adults who have IBD, and whether you're over 50 or under 50, and that's a new recommendation. Before that, it was for people who are over 50, and it's paid for by most ministries of health, as far as probably all ministries of health that, that we know of in, in Canada, if you're over 50. Uh, however, if you're under 50, coverage is still limited, so you may have to pay for the shingles vaccine. Sometimes your insurance may cover it, but you may have to pay out of pocket, and then you ask for coverage uh, from your insurance company. Hopefully, you'll be able to defend your choice to get the vaccine by showing them this clinical practice guideline when it becomes available. But because of that risk of shingles uh, in uh, people with IBD, especially who are immunosuppressed, we do recommend it. So flu, so Gil dealt with the flu and how important it is uh, in people with IBD, particularly in the time of COVID-19. There were two studies that examined the risk of influenza in IBD patients, and it looks like there is an increased risk of influenza and hospitalization from influenza if you have IBD. Uh, and this second study was in only was uh, only showed an increased risk of hospitalization in ulcerative colitis patients, not Crohn's. But in general, there seems to be uh, an increased risk. However, despite this, there's lots of evidence in IBD patients that people just aren't getting the influenza vaccine. 28% uh, of Americans in one study, 50% of Alberta children in another study, 28% of adults in Germany in a third study. So unfortunately, the message is not getting across and we're really trying to work on that. And we did a study in children under 18 with IBD in Ontario and found similar things. The good news here is that IBD patients were more likely to get the vaccine than non-IBD patients. However, we're still only reaching like 20, 25% at the most. So we're still not there yet. But in this study, uh, we compared children with IBD uh, to non-IBD patients. And then we also compared children with IBD to themselves. So comparing the years that they got the flu shot compared to the years that they didn't get the flu shot. And what we found was the original purpose of the study was to look at whether the flu might cause a flare up of IBD. And we found that there was really no evidence that it caused a flare up of IBD as defined by increased need to see a doctor or be hospitalized for your IBD in the time period after your flu shot. What we found in fact is that in the years that children got their flu shot, they saw their doctors 20% less for IBD related reasons than in years they didn't get their flu shot. We know from lots of other viruses that viruses, getting a virus can flare up IBD. And therefore it seems like perhaps getting the flu shot prevents you from getting the flu and therefore prevents the flu from causing a flare up of your IBD. Uh, we think that viruses alter the immune system or alter the gut microbiome and that's how they cause a flare up of the IBD. But we're not sure 100%, but 
the reality is it seems like patients are better off in years that they get their flu shot, at least in this study of children with IBD. So the recommendations really were, we looked at the evidence for children, uh, adults under 65 years old and adults over 65 years old. And in, in all cases, we recommended it strongly in favor of getting your flu shot every year in all age groups. So really, really important to get your flu shot if you have IBD, both to prevent the flu and potentially to prevent flare-ups of IBD. And what additional considerations in a COVID world are there? Well, symptoms overlap. So you might think you have COVID, but it's actually the flu, and, but you're still missing school and work because of it. You got to get your COVID test. You got to wait for your COVID test results. And so you don't want to have, if you can avoid getting any sort of flu-like symptoms, you should. So the flu shot will prevent the flu, which means you're less likely to mix it up with COVID. Uh, COVID-19 and influenza co-infection might happen, and we don't really know how they will affect each other, right? We don't know if that'll cause more, make you more likely to develop pneumonia if you get co-infected with both at the same time. And I'd rather not take the chance, frankly. So I'm getting to get my flu shot this year. And as Gil mentioned, we're worried about health system overload with COVID-19. We're usually almost every year at health system overload because of the flu, especially in pediatric hospitals. And so if you can prevent that, if you can help prevent health system overload by preventing yourself from getting the flu, please, please do. So get your flu shot. Uh, the last couple of slides, I wanted to just mention special considerations with uh, school-based vaccines. Uh, so grade six to nine is typically, depending on the province, when schools administer vaccines. And you can check for your province's information at this website in terms of what vaccines are given to children in grade six to nine in your, in your, uh, in your province. But most commonly, it's HPV, the human papillomavirus, hepatitis B, and meningococcus. All three of those vaccines are recommended for people with IBD in general. Uh, and so it's important that children get vaccinated for these, for these uh, viruses. However, uh, at least Ontario decided that they will not administer the grade seven vaccines this year in the 2021 uh, school year. So uh, that's a big concern for pediatricians because that means if parents want their kids to be vaccinated, they're going to have to go to the primary care provider to get it. Uh, and primary care providers are overloaded right now, family doctors and pediatricians, and many of them are doing virtual care and things like that. So that's a concern, but we can't change that decision right now. My suggestion is that if you want your child to be vaccinated, and I would suggest that you get vaccinated, go see your primary care provider, make an appointment for these vaccines. You can theoretically wait till grade eight, but we don't know whether Ontario is going to catch up on all the vaccines they missed in grade seven. So my suggestion is get your child covered and uh, and you know get go go make an appointment with the family doctor. So with that, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and we'll move on to the panel discussion. Uh, so I wanted to introduce our panelists. So we uh, we were introduced already to uh, just make sure that I'm not sharing my screen anymore. All right. So we were introduced already to uh, Dr. Mark Loeb, who's an infectious disease expert at McMaster University and professor of microbiology at McMaster University. Uh, I also wanted to introduce Dr. Cynthia Xiao, who's a longtime friend of mine, and we trained together at University of Toronto many, many years ago, too many years ago. Uh, Dr. Xiao is a pe pregnancy and IBD specialist at University of Calgary and an associate professor uh, of medicine in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology and the Department of Medicine and Community Health Sciences at University of Calgary. Dr. Xiao's specialties include maternal fetal medicine uh, in IBD and optimization of biologic therapies in IBD as well. Uh, she established University of Calgary's IBD Pregnancy Clinic and Research Registry in 2013 uh, for pregnant women living with Crohn's and colitis. Uh, and Dr. Xiao also sat, as I mentioned, on the, uh, on the CAG Clinical Practice Guidelines uh, Consensus Committee for the vaccines. So if we can have uh, Dr. Xiao and Dr. Loeb's webcams up. There you are. Hi, Cynthia. Hi, thank you very much for inviting me. You're very welcome. And thank you, Mark, for rejoining. I appreciate it. So let's start with a question for Cynthia. Uh, Cynthia, how safe are, is the flu vaccine for pregnant women? And is it effective? Yeah, I want to reassure everyone that um, the flu vaccine is absolutely safe as well as very effective for pregnant women. So we really, really strongly recommend that you get it, particularly in light of um, the COVID pandemic. Um, it's really important because, um, as you've heard, 
the symptoms of influenza can um, also um, mimic the symptoms of COVID or vice versa. So you want to protect yourself as best as you can. And further, you're not just protecting yourself, you're protecting the health of your baby. Um, patients who are pregnant who do develop the influenza um, illness are at risk of adverse outcomes, including having a baby born prematurely. And we all know that unfortunately premature or preterm babies are at increased risk of long-term complications such as other infections in life, not just influenza, but other infections are also at risk of neurological problems. So by getting the influenza vaccine, you can protect yourself, you can protect um, yourself from having the baby born too early. And then the third benefit is that there's also passive immunity, which means that you can provide protection for your baby from developing influenza in the early stages. And that's particularly important because the influenza vaccine um, is only given for kids after the age of six months. So on all those accounts, um, absolutely do recommend the influenza vaccine in terms of safety and efficacy for pregnant women. Perfect, thanks. So what other vaccines are important to consider during pregnancy? Yeah, the um, diphtheria, tetanus and pertussis, the DTaP vaccine is also really important. Um, this is something that has been, I guess, relatively new in the Canadian um, sphere for pregnant women. So in the past, um, there would just be boosters, for example, every 10 years. But now, because of the advantage of having passive immunity, again, the ability to pass those protective antibodies to your baby, they do recommend that you have the DTaP for every pregnancy. So if you have three babies, three years in a row, yes, you do re require and you should receive the DTAP for every one of those three years to help those three babies, because that's a very common question asked. You do not need to wait um, 10 years between the vaccines or 10 years between the babies. The, yeah, uh, I think some of us probably feel like pin cushions all the time. And if you're getting pregnant every year, you're probably getting lots of pokes. But I think, you know, true. we all want healthy, healthy babies when we're when we have kids. Yeah. So uh, it is important to make sure that we protect the children as well. Yeah. And what about rubella serology? That's done for every pregnant woman, right? Yeah, so there is um, a standardized prenatal testing for all pregnant women, and it does test against common viruses that a, um, a pregnant woman would um, should be immune to, and um, they include viruses that would have potentially bad effects on the baby. The big concern about the um, rubella is that um, at the moment the vaccine is a live vaccine and we do not recommend that pregnant women, regardless of whether they're immune suppressed in other ways from other medications, all pregnant women should not receive a live vaccine. So this is another call out that, you know, if you are considering a pregnancy, um, you should discuss this with your IBD specialist ahead of time because there's lots of things, as you've heard on previous webinars, that you can do to optimize that pregnancy from an IBD standpoint, from a preventive care standpoint, and should get everything done before you get pregnant. That's a perfect opportunity. Absolutely. And then I think we, that's a good segue to talk about that. I think, you know, patients should be speaking to their IBD doctor if they're on a biologic mm -hmm. uh, for their IBD about what that means for the infant. Um, and do you want to speak a little bit about what that means? Is the, the biologics transmitted to the infant in the pregnancy? Yeah. How does that work? Yeah. So um, it's really important for women who are on chronic medications um, for the IBD to continue their medications throughout the pregnancy. Um, many women are concerned that the medication will um, have bad effects for the baby, but by and large, with the exception only of tofacitinib and methotrexate, all medications are safe during pregnancy. Um, specifically for the biologics, which include infliximab, adalimumab, vedolizumab, and ustekinumab, um, we recommend that you continue that medication so that you stay well for the pregnancy because again, if you get sick, you're more likely to have a preterm birth and that has bad outcomes for baby. These biologics do not cross the placenta in the first trimester, so are not responsible for birth defects, but they do cross the placenta in the second and third trimesters, and so the baby does get exposed. And depending on which drug it is, um, on average, the drug is present in the baby's system for about six months of their life. 
So for that reason, as um, Dr. Benchamore mentioned before, um, we have in the past said that mums should not provide the live rotavirus vaccine um, to biologic exposed infants. It's only for the biologics, the other ones like azathioprine and all that you don't need to worry about. But for biologic exposed kids, don't give the live rotavirus vaccine. But the good news is that there's a lot of research about that at the moment. And perhaps in the coming years, we can demonstrate that in fact is safe because it's a different vaccine to, for example, the BCG. Yeah. So in general, I think most doctors will right now recommend that the infant does not get the mm -hmm. vaccine. Also because rotavirus is not a huge cause of death in Canada, you know, typically we can treat, although it's, it can be very, very severe in infants, it, you know, we have good hospitals, we could have a good healthcare system, and so we can treat it. Um, and so, you know, right now we're erring on the side of caution and not giving rotavirus to most infants with whose mothers are on a biologic, but that may change in the future. So let's, let's get away from pregnancy for a bit and let's talk about pneumococcus. So what is pneumococcus and what sort of symptoms does it cause? So pneumococcus is a um, bacteria um, and it can cause an, a number of illnesses, anything from having plugged ears to having gunky eyes to having a pneumonia. Um, and the big concern and why we're worried about it for our IBD patients is that it appears that IBD patients may be about one and a half times the risk of the general population for developing um, pneumococcal infections. Um, and that may occur even regardless of what kind of medications that person is on. So we talked about a number of different kind, um, different types of respiratory infections earlier. We talked about COVID, we've talked about influenza, they're both viruses. The difference with um, the pneumococcal pneumonia is it's a bacterial infection, but it can also cause a pneumonia. So it can either cause a pneumonia by itself or it can complicate a viral pneumonia. So it's really important for IBD patients, particularly those who are immune suppressed, that means that they're on a azathioprine or methotrexate or a biologic to receive the pneumococcal vaccinations prior to starting on the, um, on the medications. You get the best response if you do it beforehand, but having said that, if you've already started on the medications, you can still receive the vaccines. And generally... Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. So yeah. That's what the boosters for, right? Yeah. So there's there's two different types of pneumococcal vaccine yeah. and different frequencies. So um, the children under the um, age of five do receive it as part of the um, pediatric um, guidelines, but for um, um, older children or adults with IBD who are on biologics or immune suppressants, there are two vaccines. Usually, we give the Prevna 13 first, um, and then you wait some months before you receive the, um, the pneumococcal vaccine, the Pneumovax 23. So there are two vaccines. You have to give them best in that order with a few months apart. And then for those who continue on immunosuppressants, there is a booster dose at the five year mark. And that provides excellent coverage against um, bacterial pneumonia caused by um, the pneumococcal um, bacteria. That's great. And that's, that is what the clinical practice guideline does recommend is that, that IBD patients should be getting that vaccine. Uh, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Mark. Mark, do you agree about the pneumococcus risk and in, in, in immunosuppressed patients? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think uh, I, 100%. Good. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> um, so on a different topic, Mark, uh, are you anticipating that the COVID vaccine will be live or inactive? And obviously that will have implications for whether IBD patients can receive that vaccine if it's live or inactive. Yeah, so I'd rather not use the term inactivate because that's a particular type of vaccine. So if we talk about it as live or non-live, first of all, so if we look at the data, if we look at the WHO uh, dashboard, right, that lists all the vaccines, over 200 plus candidate vaccines, if you look at all of those, there's just a handful, just a couple that are live vaccines. So I'd say on a probability basis, it's it's, it's more likely that the successful vaccines will be uh, the quote unquote non-live vaccines. And that, but we don't know which, uh, it still could be a live vaccine, but I'm just saying from a probability standpoint, um, and it could be an RNA or a DNA or, you know, a subunit, all of those, all of those types are, are possible. 
And uh, you know, we've heard earlier that we want to avoid uh, live vaccines in patients who are immune, su immune suppressed. So if it's a non-live vaccine, um, that takes that out of the equation. So that would be a good thing if it eventually happens that way. That's great. And what are the chances once the vaccine comes out, what are the chances, this is a question from the audience, what are the chances that IBD patients are going to, quote, mount an immune response to the COVID vaccine, especially those IBD patients who are immunosuppressed, like on a biologic can you explain what mounting an immune response means to the audience first, and then explain yeah. why it's important and what yeah, we have so to do? That, so that, that you know, the answer to that has a lot of components, right? Because first of all, right now we don't actually really know what part of the immune response will be. Remember, I, I talked a little bit about the correlates of protection, right? So we don't know whether it'll be neutralizing antibodies or T cells or whatever. So we don't know what the real signal is. First of all for what will protect anybody against the against covid you know from the vaccine so that's one point so we need to know that uh, for number one number two you know when you look at studies it's usually never binary you know if unless you're using a placebo um you know when you subject someone to an antigen there's usually some sort of immune response um then the question becomes you know what is the type of immune response that you need uh, and how much of it do you need to be protected and those are the key questions so I, I do think it's really important that as the phase three trials roll out and you know a phase three vaccine seems to be effective that's when we want to be doing immunogenicity studies in people who you know who have IBD who are on immunosuppressives rapid trials, I don't think they need to be that large, maybe 500 or so, that, and that'll inform things going forward, because we want to be doing, you know, things based on data, and that's the way, I think, to do it. Yeah, so have there, this is another audience question, very good question, have there been uh, IBD patients included in the COVID trials, or the phase three trials that are out now? Um, I, you know, I, I unfortunately don't have a running list of of, of all the, uh, there's, I, you know, I'm familiar with the eligibility criteria and, you know, I, I know that a, a number of trials have at this point excluded people who are immunosuppressed, okay, the, and the rationale for that is, you know, they want to see for the first vaccine, they want to say, well, does it work? Well, if, I, if they're going to look at who it works for, that they'll look generally for either a more healthy population or some uh, some trials have said they'll include, they're including people who have medical conditions but are stable. So if someone's, you know, very, very immune suppressed, likely they might, they they would not be in uh, in at least many of these trials. I can't speak definitively though because I don't, I haven't seen all the eligibility criteria. But I, but as I say, I, I think it'll be very important that that once there is a vaccine that appears or vaccines plural that appear to work, then that's that's a point where we really want to roll out immunogenicity studies. Because the other thing is, is that even within a subgroup of a randomized controlled trial, you might not even have the power, you know, to say that. So often in a subgroup analysis, it's hypothesis generating. It doesn't give you a definitive answer. That's great. Thanks. And we will run a couple minutes over just to answer a couple more questions from the audience, if that's okay. Uh, Cynthia, a non-COVID non vaccine related question for you. Is it safe for IBD patients to get a non-live vaccine during an IBD flare? Yeah, it, it is safe um, to receive a non-live vaccine during an IBD flare, but I think I'll make several um, comments about that. You know, if you're already sick, probably talking about preventive care is one of the things that is not really top on your list. You're probably trying to get over your um, flare at that time. Um, so again, it really shouts out to the need for being um, preventive, being proactive and getting that um, vaccine early. The second thing is that if a patient is having an IBD flare, they may be treated with immune um, suppressing medications, including steroids. As you well know, steroids can make a patient feel better um, quicker and are used as an um, induction agent to get them feeling well quickly. They're not a long-term medication, that's why we didn't discuss it before. But when a patient is acutely sick, they get high doses of steroids and that can really um, impact on how well a vaccine can work. 
And then the other thing that always concerns me is that we know that in this world there is um, hesitancy for patients to receive vaccines. So if you receive a vaccine when you're already feeling sick, you may falsely attribute some of the sick feelings and the unwellness to the vaccine and that might make you more hesitant about receiving other vaccines when actually those um, symptoms were just related to the disease flare. So yeah, in summary, it does uh, uh, an IBD flare does not prevent you from receiving a non-live vaccine, but there is probably better time um, to do it, and that's um, before the flare. Agreed, and it's important to note that the non-live vaccines, no vaccine at all, has been associated with a flare-up or with new onset IBD, right? So if you get the vaccine and your IBD flares up, that's you know, in all the studies anyway that we've been able to see in large numbers of patients. The, the vaccines don't seem to be the cause of that. It just may have been bad luck. That being said, we don't obviously know everything about, about vaccines and how it changes the immune system. But for now, it seems like all the vaccines, the non-live vaccines are safe. If you're in remission, that you should be getting them and you should speak to your doctor about that. Uh, another question for Mark came from the audience. If I've had a bad reaction to getting a vaccine in the past, should I avoid getting vaccinated in the future? Well, you know, I, I think it's it, it, that's a good question, right? Because for many vaccines, uh, for example, we'll take flu vaccine. Uh, the real reason not to get vaccinated would be a very serious anaphylactic reaction. But by and large, as Cynthia was saying, there are a lot of people. For example, I'm just I'll just use the example of the flu uh, vaccine. They get they get the flu vaccine, and they get, for example, infection with another circulating virus at the same time, and they put it together, they say, oh, I got this flu vaccine and uh, it's made me sick. First of all, it's unlikely they, the flu vaccine they would have received is not a live vaccine, so they're not getting a live uh, infection, but they're confounding the relationship between the receipt of the vaccine and these adverse you know, events. So it, it's really important that for the most part, you really have to look at what is this bad reaction. And by and large, it's really anaphylaxis, the most serious type of uh, type of uh, allergic reaction that you're worried about and most of the the others generally tend to be minor or tend to be ones that people are just you know they're putting things together that really shouldn't be put together that's great uh all right i think we will uh, end it there we've sort of run through most of the questions that people have asked uh so with that uh, please let us know how we did and what you'd like covered for future webinars I think we have a plan for the next webinar, and that's to update people on the new publication from the Secure IBD Registry and the evidence behind what we know about how COVID-19 acts in IBD patients. So we think that's going to be the November webinar, uh, but please, please provide feedback as to how you felt about this webinar uh, and about the, you know, the topics that you, have, you want to cover in the future, and that the prompt will appear on your screen directly after this webinar to complete the survey. Thank you very much. And if we can get uh, the next slide, as usual, we want to thank all the frontline healthcare workers and frontline workers in general, including grocery store workers, people delivering our food, uh, restaurant workers, and everybody who are putting all their lives on the line, both to treat people with COVID and people with IBD, and also to keep our economy running as best as it possibly can at this point in time. So thank you very much. Um, I also wanted to put another plug in, as usual, for Crohn's and Colitis Canada. Uh, we've had a lot of difficulties with raising funds in a virtual world. It's not the same as, you know, raising funds pers person to person, being able to go out and ask for money, as well as holding events, fundraising events. We know that in Canada, health charities have suffered tremendously through this shutdown, through COVID-19, and Crohn's and Colitis Canada, unfortunately, is no different. Because CCC is the number one non-government funder of IPD research, that really does mean that finding a cure, unfortunately, is suffering at the same time. And, uh, you know, providing all of these programs that we do for patients, most people are working on a volunteer basis, but it does require staff behind the scenes. Uh, Sarah and Nika really help out tremendously. And, you know, we really want to be able to continue to support these types of programs and support educational events for patients, as well as advocacy events on behalf of patients to government. So with that, I put in another plea, as I always do on these webinars, to please, if you have extra funds, consider donating to Crohn's and Colitis Canada. Uh, I believe the Gutsy Walk donation is closed at this point, but you can still go to Crohn's and Colitis.ca 
and you can donate. There's a donate now button at the top right. And so please, please, if you don't mind, please donate to Crohn's and Colitis Canada if you have any extra funds. And with that, Gil, uh, Gil's still on the line. Anything else to uh, to say, Gil? Yeah, I, I just uh, wanted to thank uh, the panelists. And Erica, again, I wanted to thank you personally for jumping in there when I had some technical challenges. I actually think there might have been a ghost, Halloween ghost on this webinar between my internet crashing just as the um, webinar started and your lights mysteriously uh, turning off. Um, no, my lights is every, every day at 8 p.m. I've got to figure out a way to turn that off. <laughs> Um, but no, but I, I just want, I think it was a, a great uh, panel. And I think the last message I just want to leave everyone is I hope that you heard the, the message that we're really, really keen that everyone gets their, their flu shot this, this season. And the sooner you do it, the better. Um, stay safe, everyone. Take care, everybody.